There is this button. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> no, because there is this button and another button here, which is uh, there are two buttons. It always trick me. Okay, that's like the students find a way to trick you. So uh, just one second, I put it here. Okay, so uh, so this uh, thing I'm going to talk about today, it's uh, a very uh, interesting uh, and exciting research that we've been doing in the last uh, couple of years here in in my group. And, um, you know, it's kind of the kind of research that you can, uh, you know, succeed spectacularly or fail terribly. So there's somehow no middle ground, which is, you know, a little crazy, but I guess that's why we're here, right? So um, um, what I'm going to do today is just kind of give you a, um, an overview of this, of the things that we are doing and uh, talk a little bit in a little bit more technical detail about one of the works that, that we, have been, uh, uh, we have been working on. So the basic motivation behind this work that we've been doing in the last couple of years is basically this uh, unprecedented access, this increasing access to um, increasing amount of uh, freely available high quality code on the web in various repositories like GitHub and, and SourceForge, Bitbucket and many others. And uh, in fact, there is like a recent initiative. Uh, I, I know there's some people here on this Muse program, right, who, who are involved. Uh, and that's the term big code. Uh, it's not like big data, it's big code because it is talking about a lot of code. Okay? And so if you look at some of these uh, graphs over here, you see that uh, over time, for instance, this is the number of repositories uh, in GitHub over time, and you see that this number is kind of increasing, increasing quickly. There is about 60 million repositories today, uh, 7 million users, and you know, terabytes of, of, of source code uh, available out there freely uh, on, on the web. And similar uh, story happens with Bitbucket. Uh, I guess that's a message from about a year ago. They have about a million users, and also a lot of, uh, a lot of source code out there. Okay? So beyond these open source repositories, other stores like other app stores like the Google Play Store, they have about uh, you know about a million, a bit of more than a million programs, and uh, you know it slowly grows over time. They even have some check here for high quality or low quality programs, but generally uh, you know the, the 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 numbers are the high the good quality programs are growing slowly over time. Okay. So what we believe is that uh, this uh, massive data here that we have. It's uh, something that uh, uh, is, is really interesting because many people have spent a lot of time trying to come up with these programs and uh, you know, come up with high quality programs, come up, tested the programs, debugged the programs, invested a lot of effort into these programs. And what we'd like to do is to somehow leverage and reuse this effort for uh, solving new problems beyond what's uh, out there in the repositories. And so the basic question that, that we want to ask in this work is uh, can we come up with new techniques, okay, new techniques which uh, leverage this data here, learn from it, extract knowledge from it, in a way that we can solve problems that you couldn't solve before or are very difficult to solve before. Okay? So I'm gonna give you uh, some examples of such systems that, that we've developed here and, uh, and tell you a little bit about some of the techniques that, that we've been using. Okay? So that's the basic idea of this research, is coming up with new, uh, new techniques that uh, allow you to process this data, build statistical model, probabilistic models over the data in order to solve uh, challenges that, that uh, are difficult or hard to, so hard to solve right now. Okay? And the general technical approach that we are taking here, uh, and all of these things I'll show you are instances of this approach, 
is uh, really coming up with a careful phrasing of the problem, okay? It's very important to phrase the problem correctly in a way which allows you to creatively combine this uh, advanced program analysis and powerful machine learning techniques, like graphical models, like uh, you know, neural networks, things like this. And you have to really very carefully uh, phrase the problem in a way that, 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 that you can use these techniques. All right, so essentially what we're going to do for all of these instances I'm gonna show you, you're gonna take this big code and you're gonna build probabilistic models over the code. And then uh, you're going to use these probabilistic models to do prediction, okay? You're gonna predict new code, you're gonna predict new invariants, you're gonna predict the obfuscations of code, you can predict translation of code and ma many other tasks that are very commonplace. So, uh, over the last couple of years, as I mentioned, we've done, uh, we've done several works uh, one of the first work was this uh, statistical code synthesis, statistical code completion that appears at PODI. Uh, later, I guess in about, in about two weeks, there's gonna be a paper that's going to appear at, at Onward, which is doing kind of like Google Translate, but for programs, okay? So how many people use Google Translate here? Use Google Translate, okay? So this is trying to do something, but uh, not, not, for, not for natural language, but for programming languages, okay? And this guy over there who is sitting, lift your hand, Svetoslav. Yeah, so he, he was an intern here, now a master student who works on this problem with us. Um, and the most recent work that, that's about to appear at Popo um, <coughs> is uh, trying to do something quite general. Essentially what it tries to do, it tries to predict properties of programs by learning from other programs. So you take a program and without even analyzing it, you try to predict that something is true or not about that program by learning from, from this, uh, with the statistical models. And here is probably the place I should say that, uh, you know, uh, as Martin Reinhardt says, I'm proud of the students. So the guy who, who's been driving this work sitting over there, Veselin, you can ra raise your hand. So yeah, so this guy has uh, you know, re done really remarkable work on, on uh, coming up with what I'd say are very sophisticated machine learning models and, and combining them in very creative ways. So it's really uh, been a pleasure to, to uh, work with him. So um, let me tell you briefly about this work. So I'm not going to go into technical details. I'll just tell you what it does, what you can do with it. And then I'll go into a bit more technical detail in the graphical models for, for, for the other works. So what this work does is it uh, builds a probabilistic model over lots of code and then uses this code to predict, predict uh, uh, programs, okay? And you can use this probabilistic model for synthesis. You can also use it for program repair. You can use it for many things. So let me give you an example uh, of the kind of thing that you can use it for. Okay, so this is one example. So here we have a program, and this is an Android program. It does some things, right? It, it manipulates a bunch of objects here. So the program starts, creates a camera object, then calls some method on the camera object, then creates another object, attains another object, calls a bunch of methods here. So you have that program. So what the developer wanted to do here is to do some uh, manipulation, some Android program involving multiple objects in order to accomplish some task. So that's a very common thing that that developers would write in an IDE setting, uh, in a normal setting. In fact, this is an example that was uh, 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 put on Stack Overflow, and people ask questions about this. They said, well, I have this program, but I don't know what to do with it from here on. Is this actually good? Uh, should I add some methods to it? Should I add some additional code to make, it, to make it nice, to make it correct, and do what I want it to do? And there were some answers, some correct, some incorrect. Um, what you can do is using the probabilistic model that, that the system builds, you can ask it to actually complete the program. So you can say, hey, give me the statistically most likely program here, okay? So what the program, what the system will do, the statistical uh, prediction system, is going to tell you, you know what, if you just add these blue methods here, uh, this is the program that you want. This is the statistically most likely program. So in a sense, what you heard in the morning, you can take, think of it very abstractly, you can take lots of code from all kinds of different places. You can essentially tech transfer the code to your, to, your, uh, to your program over here and, and score it. Yeah? How likely is the program? In what sense? Well, I don't remember what probability, but what I can tell you is that, I mean, there is some, some log probability, but what I can tell you is that uh, within some distance of this program, with some modification, this is the most likely program. Okay, so if I take here and I start adding some additional methods over here, it actually this is this is going to be the this is going to be the most likely program. Yeah. No, this is this is so. In this case here, what is happening is that this uh, 
what's very important, I think, uh, also to say here, is that when you're scoring the program, you're taking into account also the program itself, the existing program itself. If you don't take the existing program, in the existing partial thing that you have, you're not going to get anything interesting. No, this is, this is, I mean, there is no 40%, right? There is many, many variants here. So this would be, I don't know, like uh, zero point something percent, but the next one would be much, much lower, for instance. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the percentage is as long as it's, as long as it's the most highly likely. So typically in the system here, uh, if you complete programs, is that, um, at least for all the experiments that we've done, and these are, these are real, real examples, you get uh, the, the, re the wanted suggestions in the top three about 90% of the time. So you likely to get this, this suggestion, the one that you want. And in fact, for this example here, this is the, this is the, uh, this is the suggestion that was posted on Stack Overflow. Yep. Yep. <laughs> In what sense? No, I mean, this is, this is, this is, as I said, right, there is, this is a generative model over lots and lots of code, so the probability is never going to be, uh, it's never going to be very high for any of these programs, and because it's ranging over a huge set of programs. Yeah. No, so, so what I'm saying is that if you take the existing program into account, this black stuff over here, the, the, the chance that you get the program, so if you look at the conditional probability, the chance will be high. However, if you look at the joint probability over the whole program here, the score will be low, of course. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to it. I can, we can talk more about this. So, um, all right, so, uh, so this is, this is uh, so one of the things I want to show you here before we go into the more technical things is uh, uh, what actually the system can do. So uh, what it can do here is that it can infer things that are actually not in the training data. So the sequence over here that you see like camera open, set display orientation, camera unlock, is actually not something that's in the training data. So it kind of picks pieces from different, different places and, and al allows you to score this. So if for instance you use clustering or something and you try to do distance measurement between the program you have and some other program, you're not even going to see this completed code. Um, another thing that it does is it uh, can infer things across objects, so it's not like a single object type state thing where you just build the automata and infer the next thing. You can actually uh, combine multiple objects in, in, into the completion, into the synthesized code. And uh, uh, the last thing that, that, that's interesting about it is that, of course, it, it, it comes up with sequences that, that, that can be longer than one or two, uh, but it also infers uh, some form of scalar, scalar uh, parameters here. And uh, We've recently also worked on some improvement of this system, and uh, this is, uh, this, uh, I know it's uh, 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 Pascal, he's sitting somewhere there, he's over there, so he's made this really fast. So this, this some programs like this complete in milliseconds, okay? Um, so this is, this is uh, this kind of statistical code synthesis direction that, that we did at PODI, and um, I didn't tell you technically how it works, the only thing I'll tell you is that, uh, you know, uh, for uh, scoring programs, um, for scoring things like this, in general, when you go into this whole business, you need to find the right representation of the program. If you work directly on the syntax, it's not going to work. So people have worked on that. They try to build a syntactic model, syntactic build models based on the syntax, and uh, this doesn't work very well. So what you need to do is to find the right representation of this program, and then you can actually build a statistical model over this representation. And the way that you do that is by using uh, static analysis techniques, like alias type state analysis, in order to extract some representation of such programs, build a model, uh, build, build an abstraction of, of the program, and then score it, uh, then build a statistical model. And the statistical model that we use in this work are uh, these so-called generative models. These are, these are uh, uh, models like n-gram and recurrent neural networks. So these are actually uh, just very quite recent stuff that, that, that is actually what's used uh, generally in machine translation systems. Okay, so this is this kind of work. If you want to know more how actually you go from the program down to the model, uh, which is a very important step, you can, you can, you can, or how the scoring works, uh, uh, how do you get the probabilities, and so on and so forth, you can look, look at the paper, uh, how, how you combine the models, and so on. All right, 
So another line of work that, that we recently did, what Svetsov worked on, is this idea of uh, doing uh, machine translation for programming languages. And here the basic idea is to uh, train a large corpus of code of already existing translations between two different programs, build a statistical model, and then to use that to perform translation of new programs, okay? So this is, uh, this is, this is what this work does. And um, here, um, basically we are combining uh, uh, right, uh, things from uh, phrase-based machine translation, statistical machine translation, with uh, prefix grammar during the translation, right? So if you just do translation, statistical translation, like Google Translate does on programming languages, on programs, then you're going to get many of the uh, programs not even parsing, all right? And if you wanna make sure that things are parsing, then you have to figure out a way to actually incorporate the parsing during the translation. Because these translations typically don't w uh, work linearly over the program, and so they, you need to come up with some uh, way to integrate the parsing with the, with the translation. And once you do that, you get uh, many of the resulting programs uh, uh, being translated from one language to another, actually parsing, at least. And many of them compile about 70% or so. Svetoslav, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think it was about 6-70% or so, actually semantically preserving. And uh, there, there's a lot of things you can do here to raise these percentages. Still, the languages here are fairly close. We did this for C Sharp and Java, and they're really close languages. But the interesting part is not even converting between the syntax. The interesting part with these systems is that what it does is it learns, uh, really what one of the most valuable things here is that it learns a, 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 a table between the uh, mapping of the APIs. So it's, you're not just translating one syntax to another, you're translating the whole environment, the whole library from one uh, usage of one library into another one, and what this does, even before you do the translation, just from the training, is that you, you uh, learn these mappings between how how program us is used in one environment versus how it's used in, in a new environment. So this is very valuable, and you can actually combine this with traditional uh, translation. All right? So if you want to know more, check out the paper. Um, yeah. Yes, it learns these things also, yes. Um, right, so this is, this is this line of work. I'm not gonna talk about it because I want to focus on the latest work uh, that, that we've done. And so this is a work that's about to appear at Popo. Uh, this, what this is doing is it's trying to predict, as I mentioned, properties of programs by looking at learning from other programs, okay? So this is joint work with Vesco and, and Andreas Krause, which is a machine learning professor here at DDH. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna show you a demo of this system. So what the paper describes is a fairly general framework based on conditional random fields and, uh, and a way to take your program and convert it into a form where you can make predictions on it. What we did in our work um, is actually also implement an instantiation of this general framework. And what it does is it predicts names and types for JavaScript programs. And as you can imagine, this is actually extremely useful, uh, as I'll show you now. So, uh, it says demo here. And uh, so here's the website. We've released this website on, on June 3rd. Uh, this is a system called JS Nice, which is based on this, on this Popo paper. And what it does is it takes a JavaScript program here uh, on the left, and this program can be uh, minified, right? For instance, here, the names are minified with some existing minifier. And it doesn't have type annotations. This is a very standard case when you're looking at the, most of the code on the web looks like this, all right? Here even we have put some formatting. Most of it is not even formatted. And what the JS9 system will do is going to take this thing and it's going to actually uh, deminify it. It's going to take that program and it's actually going to infer names for those variables which were minified and it's going to infer likely types for the function parameters, okay? So you take this program, call this system, and then it, uh, it deminifies the program uh, and, and produces this program over here. All right? And so uh, this system uh, you know, has become um, um, quite useful. So for instance, if you look here, if you actually try to understand what this thing is doing, that is quite tricky if you to when everything is minified like this. There is some i's and n's and r's and all these identifiers, and you're like, what the hell is going on? Um, once you look at the deminified version, you actually see that it's partitioning the string and putting it into consecutive entries into the array. And the names kind of give you a much more uh, intuitive description of what goes on. <coughs> it is semantic preservings uh, except the avows. 
It just takes the uh, takes the minified uh, uh, takes the uh, variables which are minified and guesses new variable name. Just renaming the variables. The types are. I mean, the types are. The the ty hmm? Come. Uh, the types are basically. You can think of them as the likely annotations. The likely clients of the library. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll say this. Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about this now. Okay. But uh, you can imagine doing this for, for not just for JavaScript, but that's an example here. You can imagine do, doing this for, for any, any, any program and, uh, and uh, you know, the type inference soon will be um, you know, quite, quite precise and uh, to do things that are, uh, yeah. So Oops, yeah. Stop. Think of it as stop. Stop. It says I don't know what, what the return will be, even though here, if you look at it, it's actually it's actually array call names, right? Because we are not doing here; we, it's all purely statistical prediction. The next step would be just to in incorporate a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, static analysis going forward from this, and then then you'd get even more types. You can do that. Yeah. Yep. No, not right now. We don't want to because typically minifiers don't, don't, don't rename them because they need aliasing and all that stuff and then you get on some this, yeah. All right, yeah. What? Whether you rename object properties, the answer is no. Not right now. Yeah, okay. More question? The type of? Uh, so again, right, if you know the type of string, then you can uh, go and infer the type of line. So if you do forward analysis, then you can infer these things. Right now we're just doing the statistical part, right? All right. So uh, this is what the system is doing. As you can imagine, this system actually is very useful in this setting. Um, and uh, you know, so over time, this system has become very popular. Okay, it's more popular than I think we imagined that it's going to be. Um, so it has it has many tweets, and uh, there's this guy, right? Once we list it, this guy's like, "Tell me how this works." Right, you know, some guy is writing on Twitter. Many more people are writing here. I've been looking for this for years. I don't know. This is gold. Statistical renaming, type inference. It's an amazing tool. Blah blah. Right. So they're writing a lot of things. They must have to. So there's a lot of these tweets that that people did over time. That's interesting right, about his work is that typically you release something and they write something in, in, in some blog and then it kind of dies off. But this is like keeps going uh, months and months after after it and just keeps increasing. So of course it's in various blogs, uh, ranked in various websites, uh, posted. Somebody can read Japanese here. I don't know what this is even here. <laughs> <laughs> Some guys like writing in French. Some guys who are, and it's very funny because they're writing. I just stopped reading them after some point because they were saying how this works. And I, I mean, it's like guessing the wrong way. And, and I was like, okay, yeah. 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 You're correct. You're correct. You're correct. I also think about it this way. And so that's why we kind of called it, I mean, uh, start calling it the minification because the minification is just one of the many things that you do during obfuscation. Uh, you may partition strings, you may do all kinds of crazy things. This is not trying to deobfuscate like the whole core. That, that, that would be beyond the capability of this system. All right. So anyway, this is very widely used. It's uh, first week had about 30,000 users. Now it's used you know, many, many, you know, thousands of times a day, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, I want to help this guy now. He says, tell me how this works. So, okay, so tell him how this works a little bit. Unfortunately, he may have to read a POFO paper, and this is not, uh, <laughs> this may not, <laughs> may one, tweet. one tweet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah, I should have emailed him, right, and say, come. So let me, let me give you an idea how this works, okay? Because I think it's really interesting what goes on. Okay, so you take a program on the left. This is the program that was on the website, and then you try to predict what's on the right. Okay, this is what the JS nice predicted. So how does what does it do? Okay, so here's how it works. This is what it does. Okay, but this is very I mean, what the hell, right? I mean, so what what it's trying to do is really it's uh, learning a probabilistic model over here. X is the program that you are giving as input, and Y are the properties that you are predicting about this program. All right. So let's go back to our example here, and here is the input program. The order switched here, so keep that in mind. So this is the program here, 
and this is the program that was predicted over here, right? So you take this program over here, and what you're trying to say is, give me the, um, the give me the um, the most likely properties uh, that I'm interested in, um, uh, given given the given the input program here. So it's a build on condition no probability, right? So given this program, give me the most likely properties about this program that that, that I'm interested in. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about, because there are many, when you're building these things, there are many choices that you go through, and they're very, very important for the learning and for the inference. And how this is built, why is it this way, why is it represented in this way and not in some other way? All right? So first of all, this probabilistic model here is learned from this uh, massive code basis. And the way that it is learned is that, uh, how do you get the data? I mean, right, how do you get the data for the types? For instance, so there is a lot of programs that are already annotated, so you can learn from them. How do you get it for the deminification? Well, you take an existing program, you can minify it, and then you look at the delta, right? So a good point, uh, uh, important thing here to mention is that um, it doesn't really matter what minifier you use. They may rename the variables in a different way, but they usually rename the same set of variables. And we don't care what the target renamed variables are. We just want to rename them back to something. Okay, another important point here when you're going, when you're deciding which model you should use for your problem is to decide a priori whether you're going to be using a generative model uh, or a discriminative model, or a conditional model. Okay, these generative models which are doing probability of X and Y are actually much harder to train. Um, they, are, they are more expensive. And, and, and uh, if you're only making this query over here, just taking the most likely properties of a program, you're better off going directly for a discriminative model, okay? So this thing here that we're computing, there is what is being computed and how is it being computed. So of course, if I have generative model, I can go to, the, the, to this probabilistic result here, but it, it, it is completely unnecessary to do that, and it's expensive. So instead, what we do here is we, we directly decide to use a, a discriminative model which represents this probability directly, okay? So directly uh, captures the conditional probability. Another, I think, a very important point here, okay? When you're predicting properties of programs or predicting many things at the same time about a program, what you need to do, what you need to realize is that uh, oftentimes these properties are connected with one another. These names are not like I predict this name, then I go and predict this name, and then another name. These predictions are somehow connected. So. Um, they're dependent, okay, on one another somehow. And uh, uh, what you need to be able to do with the model is to capture this structure, this dependence. It's like, think about invariants, right? The precondition, postcondition, they're kind of related. Okay, so you need to be able to capture this structure between the properties somehow. So that's another requirement that you need, yeah? I'll get to it on the next slide. This is like always specific to the model. When you start talking about feature, this is really about how do you go about selecting the model even on the first place, okay? Here on the bottom, there are some constraints on the properties. For instance, if you have an assignment of one variable to another, you may want to encode some typing constraints. So you want your predictions to satisfy certain properties. Over here, of course, are the candidate choices that, 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 that this ranges over, and this Y over here really represents a map. So one Y is all of the properties that, that I predict, like all the different names. And another Y is different set of names. Okay, so it's not like one name. A Y here is essentially this whole prediction over here. Another Y is another, another prediction. All right? And finally, what you want to do, and that's another uh, probably a common mistake in many of these uh, you know, PO papers that use models, is that, uh, you, you know, they predict uh, separately different, uh, they try to predict marginals. Well, here, what you really want to do is to make a joint prediction. You want to predict the most likely assignment for uh, all of the, all of the uh, variables together. So you'll make a joint prediction. And so when you look at these requirements here, structure, discriminative model, joint prediction, uh, there is one model that roughly satisfies this criteria, and that's this model called the conditional random field. Okay, so this is a model that came up in machine learning about 2001, and it's very widely used for image denoisification and image recognition. All right, so this is the model that we end up using here. And the question is, still, this doesn't tell me how do I actually compute this value, right? So I know what kind of model I wanna use, but I don't know how to compute actually the values. So let me show you, and uh, that's what Ranjit is asking, right? So 
how do I actually perform the process of this of this uh, JS nice? Let's go back to the program again. It shifted on the left, and now the identifiers and various fields are, are colored. And what the coloring means is that the yellow thing is something I want to predict, and the blue thing is something that I already know. So you're going to know some properties, and you're not going to know other properties that you want to predict. So the way that the inference works when you go on JS Nice and try it out, this is what it does. So it takes your program, and from that program, it first builds, uh, first extracts uh, the things that you want to predict, these uh, yellow, uh, yellow identifiers there, and extracts them first, and then it also extracts the things that are known. So these are the things, intuitively, how you are going to be relating the known things with the unknown things. Like you can think about this deminification, all this business, as some guy like minified a bunch of identifiers, but there's many things you cannot minify, right? There's the API calls and things like this. And then in a sense, give out the information. So you want to, in a sense, relate the known things that you cannot, you cannot change with the things that are not known. As we are training uh, on, uh, on code which is uh, uh, not minified, right? So once you extract this information here, it's, uh, so you look at it, say, okay, I have these things that are unknown, there's things that are known, what am I gonna do with this? And this is very important, this step here. What you do is that you take these uh, properties that you wanna predict and properties that you already know and you relate them via this structure that I told you. So what this does is uh, it says, well, these guys are related here, I and T, by some feature function. Okay, there's some feature that somehow relates these guys. And this guy also related, and these guys are also related somehow. And in the graphical model setting, we're not gonna get into it, but there's a very particular interpretation for what the graph means, what the semantics of such a graph is. Particularly, in, in, it encodes certain dependencies and independences between the, uh, these nodes here, these random variables as they call them. Okay, so you can think of it almost intuitively as taking a program and building a dependence graph. I mean, I don't wanna say dependence graph, but it is almost like taking and just building some representation, some IR of the program. Why is there no edge between R and T? Because according to our features, these guys are actually not related. So we, we have a set of features that we use that we relate things, right? So we can, we can, we can decide whether, whether, uh, whether, uh, whether some things are related or not related. So I'm not gonna talk about these features here. There is just a set of features. For instance, we may look at some variables and find out that the alias, and if the alias, they may be related, otherwise they may not be related. Okay, so with this, this is completely, uh, uh, so there's a, a set of ways to relate these things somehow, all right? Now, once you have this network, once you build this graph, uh, the next question is how do I actually fill this graph so that it satisfies certain constraints? How am I going to predict? My job here is to predict the contents of these variables over here, these this, this, this things that I extracted. And so what I do is I have to look at the model that I trained on, okay? So in the model that I trained on, I may, uh, I'm going to have some values for this random variable. So it, I'm going to have like, well, for i and t, uh, I, I, you know, I can, if I pick for i, the identifier i, and for t, I pick the identifier step, then according to my model, this is scored as some value here. If I pick another value, it's another pair of values, it's scored in this way. If I pick a third pair of values, it's scored in another way. So this is something that is trained, that the, 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 the learning over, the, uh, over this model, learning the model has already computed these tables here, all right? And so all you need to do during the inference is to actually, so one question that I think uh, also Ranjit asked or Vijay, I don't remember, uh, is wh what are these things here? Where do you get these things over here? How are they appearing? Well, these are all of the names that you have seen in the training data on the non-minified code. So you're only picking identifiers from the things that you have seen in the training data and you can score this. Right, you're not manufacturing new identifier names which never have appeared in the training data. And so these tables tend to be like really large here, okay? And so the problem of taking this graph here and picking up the most likely assignment to these random variables, because here I'm showing one table and this table, as we'll see, oh, this table actually holds for this edge over here, which is i and t, i and t, uh, phi one, phi one, so there are tables for each of these edges, and you need to make sure that you pick the join, the, 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 the result that satisfies the, the, the joint probability over, this, over all of the tables. And if you do that, you're going to end up um, with uh, the following solution. 
This is going to be the step identifier here, the I identifier here, and the LEN identifier here, because this is the most likely joint, joint assignment to this random variable, satisfying uh, the constraints and following these tables, which are associated with every edge here. I just didn't have space to show you more tables. Okay? If you try to predict independently without the edges, I just strip the edges away, just try to predict independently without structure, you get much worse results, which is not unexpected. Okay? The choice of uh, the choice here depends only on the name I. Yes. Uh, ev well, every time. So what this is saying is that uh, if you, yes, if you have this is the highest ranked uh, the according for this feature here. Yeah. yeah for the. We get step yes. For this, yes. Yeah, this is yes. So, um, good. So now you get this graph, you get this completed thing, and then from here on, you can actually take the program, you take this network that you have predicted, and you can just put the identifiers, and you get the new program. So this is this is how this is how this uh, this is how this system works. Okay. Okay. So I told you a little bit about this. I didn't tell you actually much about the underlying graphical models or and how does this work, that's in the paper. But essentially what this amounts to this paper is doing structure predict, uh, prediction with discriminative graphical models, the CRFs, okay? And the most important thing is, the most important thing is, how do you take the program and you build it, you convert it to a representation, just like you do in compilers, so that you can apply these models. And that's the, you know, the CRFs are known. There is a lot of work on this. There's a lot of map inference, a lot of learning algorithms. The programs are known, and you have to somehow bridge these two. And, and this is what this is what the paper shows you how to do this, right? Um, so, in summary, I told you briefly, uh, technically, about the first work. That's about to appear. We're still working on the final version. Um, here, uh, this is the PODI paper uh, that that was doing statistical code synthesis. And this one, I just briefly told you that uh, is doing a machine translation between between programming languages. And uh, we're working on various topics around this space. I hope. That's something that many of you would get interested in and, uh, and, and continue working on this direction. I think it's really interesting, this combination of you know, powerful graphical, you know, powerful machine learning models with, with uh, program analysis. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Which one? The CRF. Well, the, which one? The learning? The, the learning. Uh, so, I mean, this is all, uh, all uh, basically. Hmm? Training the model. Yeah, so so this is all really uh, so th this is this is this is this is basically greedy algorithms, uh, and one of the main things is that uh, when you're doing the learning, you are uh, again the problem has to be phrased in a way where you where you avoid costly computation uh, of this partition function, which I didn't which I didn't show. But ultimately, the learning bottoms out to calling the inference procedure. So basically, the learning goes and calls inference, and the inference is a greedy algorithm that we're using. This is not guaranteed to give you the optimal map inference algorithm. I'm just asking, yeah. one minute, is it 20 days? Oh, the, so, so, so the inference here is, is almost instantaneous. That's very, so I didn't mention this point. It's actually extremely important when you're doing uh, this real-time inference. That, that If you're doing exact inference, it's just, just going to take forever. At least the current setup. Yeah? Sorry. I, yes, I mean, <laughs> where are you? Okay. Train on minimized thing. If what, sorry? If you train on minimized data set, yeah. you give it a non-minimized thing. Yeah. You get a minimized. You'll you get some, yeah, you'll learn some conversions between how to, how to actually do the statistical minification. Okay, and is that the inverse of the demon Uh Well, not because everything is greedy here. I mean, if it was optimal, maybe you'd get very close. Okay. But in, with these greedy algorithms, it, it, it's a good question. I, 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 I mean, yeah. How long would it take? How long would it take? So, uh, so how long is it, if I just keep doing things back and forth, it's actually going to cycle, right? How long is it cycle? Uh, keep doing, ah, uh, uh, I mean, you're just training and then training and then no, 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 training. No, 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 no,
I'm not sure. Oh, really. That's the first set you will get. Yeah. Yeah. Except, so it is that they are actually inverted. Yeah, we are, we are all going to give you the same day inside version, no matter how you inside. Okay. No, but this, this is, I think he's asking something, and he's saying if you keep the, the minifying and minifying, if, of course, if you rename the same variable, you get the same thing, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Just so you evaluate it by then checking on some something <coughs> that you end up getting the original program, is that right? Uh, so yeah, in the evaluation, we basically take programs that are already non-minified, and then we minify them, and then see whether we can get the original. original How close list. you get to your original? Yeah. How close? That's that's the best we can do here. So people people seem to like it. I mean, this is a system that can take jQuery and essentially the minified. They they paste quite large codes here. Seems to work, uh, and, and I mean, there, there, there is many improvements here that can be made. Yeah, I mean, this is a question that was asked by the reviewers as well. If you does the minifier matter with different minifiers, would you produce different results? And the answer is no, but only if they, they rename minify the same set of variables. If they minify different sets of variables, then you know. Yeah. So I just want to add one more pedantic. Yeah. Point. Minification is also not just algorithm, right? There's a lot of other stuff you can do with minification. <laughs> But yes. but yeah, yeah, this is a form of minification. Yeah. What do you want to put statistical form of minification? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's stop the discussion. Let's take the rest of the time in the interest of time. Thank you very much. All right.